Good morning from Houston and good day to you around the world. We already have participants here from uh, the Middle East and New Zealand. So good day and good evening to you folks. Um, this is an IDC virtual panel discussion on Drillbit Forensics. It's part of a larger project to upgrade the IDC Drillbit grading uh, process. And uh, as part of that, uh, obviously, we need to become a lot more familiar with BIT and BHA forensics. So our main speaker today will be Paul Pastusik of ExxonMobil. Uh, also available on the panel are Dustin Dexel of Shell and Robert Van Kallenberg of, of Noble Drilling. Uh, I'm Robin McMillan. I'm the VP of Drilling Services at the IDC. So let me uh, introduce our main speaker, Paul Pastusik. Paul is a drilling mechanics advisor at ExxonMobil. Um, he's experienced in all sorts of things, uh, automation, drill string dynamics, steerable systems, borehole quality, bit applications, cutting mechanics, rig administration, control systems, and all sorts of failure analysis. Um, he received the 2020 SP International Drilling Engineering Award and the 2017 GCS uh, Regional Drilling Engineering Award also. Um, he has a BSME from Texas A&M and an MBA from the University of Houston with 42 years experience redesigning and drilling processes and the tools to the economic limit. I think we're, a lot of us are familiar with uh, Exxon finding, uh, finding technical and economic limits. He's a registered professional, holds 42 US patents, has delivered 41 papers, and he's just about to deliver another. So over to you, Paul Pastusik. Thank you, Robin. Uh, well, good morning and good afternoon and uh, good evening to some of you as well. So um, I'm going to, uh, th this presentation is the training session that we give internally to ExxonMobil uh, employees. So actually, I am, uh, I am the subject matter expert on our uh, forensics work. And I shouldn't say all forensics. So anybody that's doing pipeline or metallurgy or that kind of a forensics is another story. Uh, this is really related to bits and BHAs and, and uh, components in the drill string, things that we typically see. So um, uh, what the uh, IEDC is going to record this session, so they'll be available for the future. Uh, and th this presentation is available to everyone in a PDF format uh, uh, to use. Uh, I, I have permission from several vendors to use uh, videos for training purposes and for this material, but uh, not to distribute that. So if you if you see a video that you like and go, oh man, that really explains things, then please approach the original reference source and, and ask for that video to be used. So anyway, uh, we have a lot of slides to go through today, so I'm gonna just jump right in and, and get started. Um, and uh, we will have some Q&A, hopefully it's a little Q&A at the time, at the end. Um, if, you, if you have any questions along the way, uh, feel free to type them into the chat box and Dustin and, and Robert and Robin will try to answer them uh, as we go. And then uh, in addition to that, we'll stop and, and uh, maybe discuss some of those as well. So. Uh, kind of what are we going to talk about today is, is you know, forensics uh, as a um, as a ability using forensics photos and and uh, diagnostic tools uh, to tell you about what's going on in the well and what's going on with your drilling situation. So, uh, first order of business, we're talking about the observations and documentation needed. We'll talk about bit forensics. Uh, and you guys, I don't know if you remember lead, learning to read, but uh, I do. I'm, my, I'm the youngest of, of uh, six kids and uh, everybody else could read and I couldn't. And it was really frustrating back, they, they had these things called uh, funny papers, the comics uh, on Sunday and everybody else could read those and I couldn't. And I remember being frustrated. Well, what we're gonna do on forensics is I'm gonna teach you about uh, probably about eight or 10 words that represent the bulk of what you will see in, in forensics. So if you learn those eight or 10 words, you can read the, the wear scars and you can read the, um, the erosion corrosion for and uh, and fracture damage of bits and BHA. So, and it will be most of what you see, not everything. The good news is those things that you don't uh, encounter very often, they'll stick with you and you'll learn those real quickly. You know, I, that's something new. I haven't figured that out yet. So, uh, okay. So, you know, why are we, uh, why are we learning this? The, the idea is to incorporate this as a diagnostic tool uh, to identify what the limiters are and the corrective actions. 
Um, it's, it is one of those foundations for continuous improvement. If you think about uh, um, what am I trying to do? I can look at digital data, but I really many, many times I need to see what the condition, condition of the tools were as well. I can do this on offset wells as well as the current well. Um, I used to have uh, document the bit and the BHA. Uh, I used to have that highlighted because within ExxonMobil, we spent a lot of time getting bit photos, but we didn't really take a lot of BHA photos. And you're going to see why now we do. And we have now for uh, 10 or 12 years now, we've been really uh, focusing on both. Uh, they, are, uh, they are both required and they are both part of our IDC code uh, work as well. Uh, I always say photos are required. Uh, the IDC dough grades are insufficient to tell you everything. In fact, that's why we started this upgrade project in the first place. Is, uh, I, for many years, I fussed and said, oh, this is just not good enough. And uh, finally, <laughs> finally, we got a group together and said, let's do something about it. So uh, a, a good example for those of you uh, familiar with IDC code. So I've got a grade one, one, uh, that's one on the inner two thirds. A one on the outer one third, you know, one out of out of eight. That's not too bad, right? Uh, broken teeth. I broke a tooth. Mm, okay, well, it must not be too bad because it's still one one. It's on the nose. X means it doesn't have bearings. It's a PDC bit. It's in gauge and it has some worn teeth as a secondary and it TD the hole. So you know, you look at that. You think that's a pretty good looking bit. I shouldn't have any issue with that at all. Um, here's the bit that was uh, was graded that way, and. Uh, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, goodness gracious. Look at this. Look at this damage here. I broke this cutter in half. I broke that one in half. There's uh, there's and, and worn it. And then the wear here, there's wear there. Um, there's a little wear scar here. None of that was kind of obvious to me in reading one one. But if you go to the let's go to the IDC code the way it says it, it says average average the inner two thirds. So I'm just going to say this is the inner two thirds. One, two, three, four. That's a zero, zero, zero. And remember this four is half gone. So, okay, that's that's uh, four divided by four would be one. Okay. And then on the outside, uh, well, actually I don't see where, maybe they maybe they gave that, a, that the grade is maybe a little harsh. Maybe it should be uh, uh, one zero, right? Um, you see where this goes is that if you're doing this on averages, it doesn't really tell the story. And, and again, that's, uh, that is the basis that, uh, that we have used in Exxon set always, always get pictures, um, of our digital images, at least scans and, uh, and then, uh, Let's talk from there. So I think uh, you're going to see some good work from this this team that's uh, that's working on these to try to to give us a better set of metadata so that we can search and look and understand. So I'm going to come back to this photo later. So um, all right. So uh, you know, kind of what what documentation do we want? We want bit photos. We want to label the blades uh, and or the cones from one to n. The number one blade is the innermost cutter on it, whether that's a PDC or a, a that's a just general industry practice. A headshot straight down, uh, and then 45 degrees close-up uh, photo per blade. Uh, you know, I say we don't want uh, we don't want landscape views where I can see the rig and the sunset in the background. You know, we need we need to be up and close and personal with everything. Um, and then uh, pictures of gauge pads, shanks, and APA pin or anything else that may be damaged. It's a good idea to take pictures of gauge pads even when they're not damaged, because later you'll see uh, something shows up, in, up up above you in the drill string and you say, was the bit engaged or did it have any damage at all that looks like this or whatever. So, so sometimes zero damage is a good thing to document as well. And, and these are kind of our bare minimums. On the BHA, we label the stabilizers of blades, one, two, three, four, uh, how many of them there are. Uh, somebody asked me, what's, what's stabilizer blade one? And for today, uh, we just arbitrarily picked the one that I put a number one mark on becomes number one, right? So why, why, why bother labeling them if I can't really tell the difference? And the answer is we get uneven wear. And in your photos, if you just put a, put a marker on it, one, two, three, you can, as you take pictures, you'll see that they're different. And uh, we'll, we'll show you an example of that. Uh, note the location of even minor wear patterns and wear scars. Why? Because uh, you're going to find out that uh, sometimes you'll see a really catastrophic event and you'll go back and look and realize it was going on in the past. It was going on uh, uh, on many other occasions as well. So 
Um, okay, so document the diameter and location of the stabilizers in the drill string, uh, close up, fill the screen, take enough pictures that you get them blur free. And you can utilize the light source as a direction. So one of the scanning guys uh, was taking pictures with beautiful lighting everywhere. And I said, sometimes in order to see these fine little wear scars and wear marks, it's better to actually have the light uh, 90 degrees to the camera. So I'll show you that in a sec. So, um, you know, here's an example of the blades are labeled one, two, three, uh, all, all the way around. And I can see the front face of the cutter and I can see this wear uh, scar surface as well. So that's kind of a typical picture of the blade. That's a, that's a headshot, what I would call a headshot or straight down, uh, close up. Uh, and here's, here's one per blade, one picture per blade where you can see both the front surface and the, and the wear scar. Uh, here's a blade on the stabilizer that's worn and, uh, and you see it's not even wear. So it just happens to be number three. We'll, again, we'll figure out what one, two, and three is. Um, uh, someone on the group already has suggested that we get stabilizer manufacturers to put like their serial number or something on the side of the blade uh, on blade one. So, and, and maybe that's arbitrary at the time, but, but as we track wear and, and things, that might be a good idea. So not opposed to that at all, in fact. Um, we, we have a uh, kind of a rig poster that, uh, that describes what we want people to take pictures of and, you know, how to, how to take those pictures and et cetera. And it's just, uh, uh, you know, readily available to do something like that to, to get people to take what you want. And if you use that information, they'll, uh, they'll go out of their way to take those photos. Uh, I've seen uh, people uh, really take, uh, take a lot of extra effort to do this. Um, take a, take the documentation. So I'm going to look at an example. Here's the documentation. Uh, it happens to be a, a, a BHA sheet and uh, you know shows shows the location and the diameters and lengths of all the stabilizers. And then here's the uh, headshot. Uh, the bit is engaged. It's reported to be engaged, by the way. And you know, look at the gauge ring and look at the bit. It looks pretty good, right? Uh, this is one of those why I need more than one photo. Uh, is it really engaged? Well. Okay. <laughs> is it engaged? Uh, it is up here. It isn't down here. So, you know, I clearly have a ring out. And if I put the ring gauge on, do, it, do I have a long section of hole that's way under gauge? The answer is no. It's only about four inches or something like this is, I think, a 12 and a quarter. Um, you know, it's only this little bit that's under gauge. But, you know, do I call it engaged or do I call it under gauge? Ah, gosh, I don't know. IDC says if I put a ring gauge on it and it's, you know, it's good. Yeah. So again, one of those one of those things that I think we just need to clarify. Uh, in this case, for certain, it's uh, it is a ring out, right? So we we definitely know that. Um, here's pictures of those blades: one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and you can see heat check marks right here. Uh, those heat check marks are after the fact; they're not the cause of the damage. You know, so do I label that as heat checking? Well, yeah, I can, but that's probably not the cause. Um, here are the blades, you know, the, the uh, one through six. Uh, I'm going to point out something. This blade is worn just a little bit. This blade is worn a lot more and a lot more and a little bit. And, and if you look at this, the, um, the, the wear around the bit is uneven. So this bit is running off center, uh, what we call forward work, right? So if you see things like that, uh, you know, it's not obvious if you just take a, an overview of the, of the whole entire drill bit. Uh, and it's not obvious necessarily if you don't label the blades, because I don't know which order they come in. So, so being able to see that is, is uh, quite useful. Um, stabilizer documentation is, is uh, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the stabilizer, the diameter went in and the diameter came out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, here's that. Here's the complete documentation on that particular stabilizer. One, two, three. Look at this. Uh, there's wear right here, and there's wear right here. Again, this is that forward whirl, jump rope motion, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, the guys labeled it that, um, and, uh, and in fact, I agreed with them. I called it. You know, said, hey, this is a good cause. This is in fact uh, an indication of forward whirl, right? Uh, it, we have a rotor reamer in the hole. This is the pictures of the rotor reamer. Uh, they, they say it all looks fine. In fact, I couldn't find any damage to the rotor reamer at all. I couldn't, uh, couldn't discern any, uh, any notable wear scars at all. 
Uh, so what are we going to do here? <clears throat> Again, I told you we're, we're going to look at a few uh, words to, uh, to teach. Uh, one, we're going to talk about beach marks. Uh, we're going to talk about plastic hands, tangential cutter fracture. Uh, then we'll talk about some wear scars on the bit. So that's that's four different topics. Uh, and we'll talk about the wear scars from forward whirl, five, uh, reverse whirl, and boral pattern. So that's five, six, seven. And then we'll talk about balling. So, a little bit. so that's uh, eight. So that's really only about eight words you really need to remember and, and you get the bulk of it. Um, all right. So, uh, I, you know, this, this rock is out of my garden and uh, it's amazing that we put rocks in our garden, but we do for French drains or whatever. This happens to be a piece of shirt. Uh, I want to show you the difference of lighting right here. This down here is that same picture of this. Uh, this rock's only a couple inches in diameter. Uh, I just changed, all I did there was change the contrast on the, on the uh, uh, picture after it was taken so I could highlight these concentric rings. So these concentric rings are called beach marks. Uh, if you look at them, it's like dropping a pebble into a pond that the center of those rings is where the fracture initiated. So, so this is where the fracture started, and then this, these are the beach marks going upward. Uh, this little piece of rock here is a couple of inches in, in, uh, in across of this direction. This is, uh, this is I think, Fred DePriest, one of his vacation photos in the western United States. Uh, and you see this uh, slippage where it fractured right here, and you can see the beach marks above. And, you know, this scale is like 20 feet, uh, the, those uh, red rock sandstone cliffs. Um, all right, why do I care about rocks? Well, I, PDC cutters do the same thing. So, so if I see spalling of the, uh, we might call it spalling or beach marks on the edge, it's due to this edge loading and the exact direction is approximately normal to the profile. Okay, and uh, here's a video from uh, Verrill of a test, uh, lab test that they do. Uh, by the way, you do see there is some element of fatigue here because we're running the same load over and over again. And in just a second, there it goes, it popped right there. That, that center of that uh, ellipse in this case is right down here where I fractured. So um, we did write a paper about the load direction matters. So if you look at, if you load this whole diamond in compression, it takes quite a bit of load F. It only takes, if you're going normal to the profile like this, it only takes 65% uh, of, uh, of that same F in order to spall that cutter. So, so load direction does matter, but I know in general, it's down in this range over here if I'm going to spall. Okay. So what do we look at for, for cutters? Uh, you see the beach marks here. You see these over here. You see these over here. This is multiple hits. There's beach marks here. <clears throat> If I follow the direction of load, even though this piece is still intact, look at the beach marks. The beach marks are pointing me up toward the, the, the top here. So this was actually a, 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 an axial bit. Uh, this one has multiple beach marks with multiple directions, suggest so a bunch of hits. Could be junk, could be some flakes and debris as well, but uh, multiple fractures in that normal direction. And then you see this one, that's cutter number one, and it is angled a little bit toward the inside. This is also cutter number one, and it's coming in way from the inside. I can see that when I get bit whirl. If the bit was a reverse whirl, the center of the bit's moving back and forth across that little uh, uncut cone in the center, and it's a hard enough rock to pop that down the table. Hi, Paul, excuse me, this is Robin. Yes. Um, your voice is coming and going. Well, I don't know if it's the distance from the microphone. I can I can fix that. Tell you what, Robin, interrupt me. I'm going to lean forward a little bit more and of back. And uh, if that doesn't work, I've got headphones I can plug in. Okay. Thanks. Just give me a couple of slides and let me know if that works. Okay. Um, here is, uh, you know, I think many of you have seen the the damage that occurs with reverse bit whirl. And, uh, and you see the, the preferential damage on the outside, all the spalling of the diamond tables, and, and then of course the rapid wear after. Uh, you can see this on the gauge trimmers, and in this case you can see multiple hits here. Um, if, if you haven't seen a video of Whirl, we've got one come in. But, uh, 
for uh, BHAs. For the bit whirl, um, this bit is is uh, gearing around the inside of the hole, and so you see this really rough pattern. You don't see the normal beehive pattern. Is that better, Robin? Yeah, that's better. Thanks. Okay. All right. <clears throat> This is a great example well, from, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, you, you faded it again, just as you were saying that, but I think if you, as long as you uh, retain the distance from the mic, I think you'll be fine. I can fix it. Give, give me just half a second. Okay, can you hear me better? Yeah. All right. Good. Thank All you. Right. Paul. Yep, you bet. Um, okay, so uh, this is a bit we ran, uh, drilled out the shoe, and uh, you can see piece of the float equipment right here. The dart actually is still in there. This is only drilled about 100 feet or 200 feet. Um, and you see this damage. Uh, somebody said, uh, hey, this. Uh, this bit could, uh, we couldn't steer. We kept stalling the motor. Uh, they wanted to kick off right away. And uh, every time they, they tried to steer, the motor stalled itself. And the rest of the bit is brand new. I mean, it hasn't drilled 100 feet, but you see this damage on the gauge trimmer right here. Um, that, is, that is due to drill out damage. So we're inside of the casing. All these other cutters, there's a little chip here, but all these other cutters were um, against cement or or mud, actually, and this guy was against eighty thousand or hundred thousand psi steel. So, so the first question you ask is, you know, when I see this this uh, spalling and delamination on the OD, uh, usually it occurs on the shoulder as well, and the PDC gauge trimmers are the toughest thing, so they usually don't get damaged. When you see that, you start asking, hey, is this uh, uh, perhaps drill out damage. And, and when we looked at the rest of the bit, all the other gauges look, all the other gauge cutters. So this bit was drilling about a 12 inch hole and the last quarter inch was trying to be uh, drilled with these gauge pads. And um, so again, we started stalling the motor right away. We checked, make sure that the motor wasn't damaged or, and it had good differential pressure before it stalled. And, uh, and the first reaction is, uh, but the bit's green. It only drilled 100 feet. And again, when you look a little closer, this is, this is the kind of level of detail you need to get into. Um, so spalling, uh, you know, this is here's spalling of, of a shaped cutter, but you can see the, the beach marks here is pointing you to the, to the fracture initiation event. You can see the spalling of these. These are right on the nose. Uh, the fact that they're on the nose suggests that it's an axial kind of a, of a damage, right? Uh, this is one that's, uh, that's fun. It used to have a profile up here like that, right? It used to have a, a nose and a cone and all that. Uh, I spalled the cutters, but I've also damaged the front of the blade. Do you see that damage to the front of the blade, the damage right down here to the front, and there's damage over here to the front. Uh, that suggests to me that we dropped this bit. That's not a minor amount of spalling or, or whatever. That's not just a little bit axial bounce. Probably much, much more likely that we tag bottom with the bit when we made a connection. So I don't have the digital data for this one. This is an example. I wish I did, but uh, but uh, that's, my, that's my analysis so far. Uh, there is something else going on here. Look at all this damage out here on this outside. Um, what's going on here? Well, um, once I once I damage the nose, I don't go forward anywhere, and these cutters are still sharp, so they still dig in. So, if anybody know that at low depths of cut bits become real unstable, they go into reverse whirl. Uh, there is, by definition, there's nothing left here to go forward, and I'm still aggressive on the on the OD here. So I'm banging around the side, and I'm walking around like a gearing motion. Notice this damage is to the back of the blade. It's, it's so what I believe is all the debris that we had here uh, accumulated and it came up just enough into the gauge pads and then we damaged it. Could there have been junk in the hole when I did this? The answer is yes, if it was a if it was the first bit in or I just had tripped it in. Um, if I'd been in the middle of a run, I would be looking probably 
for a tag bottom event. But, but again, you need the digital data to go back and, and verify exactly what happened. What I can tell you from this dough is, sure, it looks like we tag bottom or potentially junk. And then number two, we ran on that, the junk that we created, and uh, we're whirling here uh, at the end. So uh, here's an example. We broke, uh, you see these missing cutters. And, and again, from an IDC code standpoint, you can say, hey, these guys are missing. But what I really care about is, yes, this is a broken blade, all right. But more importantly, it's small down the front. And this this damage right here tells me that the load was, oops, was in the axial direction right here. Okay, and you can see that here as well. So I care not just about that it's broken, but I care the direction because I'm going to go back and look at the digital data and say, do I need to change my connection practices? Um, is there something else going on that I that I need to? Maybe I had bit bounce and then I need to put a shock sub in, uh, et cetera. Hi, Paul. Your voice is fading away again. Oh, that's interesting because I'm not. I'm talking well. Uh, I, I, Robin. I tell you what. I will talk louder. I'm in a. I'm in a conference room, so I can talk as loud as you need. But uh, uh, feel free. Okay. To I'm not far away. I'll, I'll let you know when I can hear you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, it sounds like it's maybe a connection thing. I can, I, I may be able to uh, stop my video. Let me do that real quick. Well, I would also suggest if you happen to have anything else running on your machine that's not necessary, you might close it, see if that assists as well. Let me uh, let me check and see. I don't actually think I've got anything else going. Uh, well, yeah, sure. I do have my inbox here. Let's go, let's go. Just a reminder for attendees, you're welcome to use the chat box or submit formal questions through the Q&A function, and we'll be addressing those throughout. There's nothing else open. Um, so, you know, that was Stephanie Colling of IDC. And... Um, Regarding the questions, if we don't get to the questions during the presentation, uh, then we'll be answering them afterwards. Thanks. Over back to you, Paul. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go back to uh, to slideshow here. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, and I've I've closed down anything else, so hopefully. Yeah, that... it looks like you need to be in presentation mode, Paul. Uh, I am. Uh, oh, okay. it's sharing the wrong screen. Hang on, I can. There we go. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, so now we, we know about beach marks, right? We we know how to read them. Um, we can uh, we can look at what's going to happen. So if I have beach marks on the OD, it's probably due to uh, lateral vibration or bit whirl, reverse bit whirl, particularly we're talking about, right? Uh, if the uh, if the beach marks are maybe the same cutters, some of the same cutters, but if it's on the nose, it's going to be from an axial uh, bit bounce or, or even tagging bottom, right? Um, I used to show damage inside the nose here. Um, let me get over here. So I used to show delamination and damage here to the inside. Uh, it is so rare today. The last picture I have from that is over 10 years old. And, and it's simply because the cutters, uh, and it happens with stick slip, or at least uh, the data that I, the, the example I had was uh, from stick slip. And um, it happens so rarely now, I can't really rely. I can have very severe stick slip and they just don't show up. And why is that? It's because the cutters are tougher than they've, than they've ever been. So, so I don't show that as a diagnostic anymore. I, you know, in terms of uh, one, it's not it's not often seen, and number two, uh, I can have severe severe stick slip and not see this damage. So it doesn't become really a really good diagnostic for stick slip. Uh, digital data is uh, can you look at my torque variation as a much better diagnostic. Uh, okay, so uh, is there any questions up to date that that I should answer? Uh, there's a question here, Paul. Um, 
asking about the time frame that we uh, the, the question is what time frame are IDC looking to introduce the new dull bit grading method I, I guess we can get back to that question with regard to the timeline that we've presented in the past yeah, we certainly, uh, I'm hoping to make uh, substantially good progress this year and, and publish in 2022, both in the spring and the fall conference that we get our groups together to do that. But uh, uh, whether we're completely done or not, I think that's, we, we could talk about that. That's a good point. And, and we can even show share that timeline. Yeah. There was another question which you answered. Uh, that's whether or not with a dull bit that's under gauge, would you still take a picture with the gauge ring? Um, I guess the question there is, is yes. And in more than one place on the gauge, if there was yeah. a bit like the one you showed where there was somewhere, but there was some part of the gauge that was still unworn. It's Yeah, it's really important to know, do I have just two inches of, of hard rock that I need to uh, accommodate and drill out and figure out, or do I need to be careful on the last thousand feet coming, tripping into the hole? Do I need to ring my way to bottom? And in fact, if I have a thousand feet of under gauge hole, I better probably plan on a, on a check trip where I clean, I do a clean out and then go back in with a, uh, pull that out of the ground. And put mm -hmm. and yeah. So yeah, so it definitely is important to know. Okay. Okay. All right. So I, I normally ask, uh, you know, what do you, uh, learnings check here and ask questions. What do you need for a case study? Photos, bit information, daily reports, digital data, one sample per second, downhole memory and telemetry data, and formation and information. Those are kind of the, the, the bare minimums of, of what you ask for. Uh, as you start doing a forensic analysis, uh, it can lead you in a certain direction. You may, you may never get everything you ask for. You, in fact, actually, I, I don't know that I've ever walked away and said, man, I just have too much data. Um, so just recognize that you're making a decision uh, many times in real life, in real time, and you won't have everything you wish you had. But if you get used to it, if, if this is collected routinely, uh, it allows you to... Uh, uh, make sense of it and, and it's readily available then when you do need it. Uh, what's the effect of the load direction on, on the failure load? Uh, it's strongest in compression. If the time and table is put in tension, either loading backwards, so like if the bit rotates backwards, or uh, if, if I've got a real high um, uh, a compression force in the uh, in the tangential direction where it can bend the diamond table. Uh, anytime I put the diamond table in tension, that's, uh, that can be bad. Uh, and uh, so uh, fracture initiation sites, it's the center of the ellipse. Uh, direction of motion for the for beach marks, it would be an edge loading or normal to the profile. So, uh, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do all of these questions, but uh, that's just an idea of kind of what we do to, to, to uh, ask people to engage, if you will. So I, I, uh, I, I sent it out to Linda and said, hey, if you, everybody brings chalk to this demo, uh, they can do these hands-on demonstrations. And when I'm doing these live, I bring uh, loads of chalk and I bring some real cookies and I've got a few other uh, little things, sandpaper that I, uh, I use for demonstration purposes. I'm, a, I'm known as the toy guy. so. Um, so here's the deal. If you take a piece of chalk and a good quality high, white chalk, and and if you break it in bending, so I'm going to put this in bending, and it's going to break right here. But we're pushing these two ends together slightly. So just one or two pounds of compression, and and then I want you to break it in bending. And what you'll get is this is a called a plastic hinge. This is when I went from tension on this side to compression on this side, and the compression. Is a is going to be a shear failure, and that's that 45 degree. You might remember their their uh, 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 materials and mechanics uh, study that that compression load, and that is going to be a 45. So I go along here, and I go down, and then I break off here to the side. Of this now, will I always see that? The answer is no. So uh, I ask you to try this at home. Uh, again, take, a, take another piece of chalk or, or that same one, take the bigger piece, the end of it, and then break it in bending, but pull slightly. So just, you know, just again, not don't pull it in two, just give it just a pound or two of, of tension and then bend it, okay? Um, and when you do that, 
you'll see that there's no hinge. There's no plastic hinge. So the point of that story is, well, you always see a plastic hinge if you have bending, and the answer is no. It depends on the loading. But if you do see the plastic hinge, it's a really good diagnostic. So, all right, we do that for chalk. We can do that for drill bits. Okay, so uh, here's my drill bit. The low direction was in the tangential direction. I broke off the back of these, these backup cutters. And then you see this plastic hinge where I changed direction here. So I was loading it and, and bending, and that part was in compression. This part was in tension, right? Uh, okay. Uh, this damage to the gauge tremor suggests whirl, and the fact that I'm loading in this direction, and I loaded the backup cutters. The backup cutters are typically well below the cutting plane of these guys, so they wouldn't take a load unless the bit was vibrating and uh, uh, are not significant load. So one, I probably, this bit was swirling, number one. Number two, uh, I might be inside the casing seat or inside of the, of the, the uh, casing itself uh, when I did this because this is enough damage to, to cause this and this damage as well, okay? Uh, another case of plastic hinge. Here's my old plastic hinge right back here on the back side and uh, suggest this low direction is primarily in the, in the cutting direction of what I call the tangential direction. Same thing back here, plastic hinge again. Okay. Uh, this was a great example. Uh, Eric McLean uh, uh, brought this one in uh, some, some, so gosh, at least probably almost 10 years ago now. Uh, this used to be a six blade bit and we made it into a convertible. Now it's only a three blade bit. Uh, and I lost the three secondary blades. So the three main blades, by the way, when you break a blade, it's almost always a secondary, right? Because uh, they're weaker. Now these are blades are really quite thick. I mean, they're not, they're not with substantial blades. But where's the plastic hinge? If it, if it was in if it was in tangential direction. Now, by the way, I also noticed this bit rung out substantial ring out here, right? So, so I'm loading uh, uh, the OD of this bit a lot with a kind of pencil sharpener effect, if you will, right? Here's the plastic hinge on the inside edge of the blade, and there's a plastic hinge right here, and here's the plastic hinge right here. So I loaded these three blades from the outside in. Now I can go and, and fuss at the manufacturer and I can make them do all kinds of materials analysis and everything else. The answer is I ran on this bit longer than I should have. It rung out, the ROP was, was down to essentially zero and I continued to run it. And, and uh, uh, I happen to know the rest of the story is that we only had a couple of hundred feet to go and it was like, can we make it? Can we make it? Can we make it? And the answer was no, we could not. Um, so, and when you're drilling fast, if a bit drops to five foot an hour, you know it and you just go, I got to pull it. But if you're drilling 10 foot an hour and it drops to five foot an hour, it can take you a couple hours to decide that, uh, hey, it's really dull and it's time to pull it, right? So no, no, uh, no judgment here about, you know, uh, pull criteria. We can have that discussion. And, uh, and we did, in fact, I think Eric's going to submit this as a, as a case study uh, for, the, for the IDC case study group. So uh, anyway, there's more data to go with this. But I just wanted to show this plastic hinge. Pay, pay attention to where the plastic hinge is and let that guide you. Don't just assume that it's normally loaded uh, uh, you know, in, in the case like you normally would think it was a blade in bending. Okay? Uh, so yeah, there's my plastic hinge and that suggests the load direction is inward. Uh, I told you about Oreo cookies, man. Uh, one of my favorites. So uh, I want you to, now we're gonna take a cutter uh, pretend this is a cutter. This is the black stuff is the diamond. The white squishy stuff in the middle of the Oreo cookie is the tungsten carbide. And, uh, and I'm going to load a diamond until it breaks. So I load the edge until it breaks. Uh, I get this, what I call the Oreo cookie break or the tangential load break. Uh, and I wind up with something that looks like this right here. Okay. So what have I done? I've overloaded the structural integrity of this of this cookie and I can do the same thing on a cutter, right? Now this one's, this one's just cracked. It hasn't broken all the way through, which you get the idea. Uh, and if I drill along and I overload in this direction, the load goes up high enough, it puts this in, uh, in compression right here and it bends around and there'll be a plastic hinge right back here at the back of the cutting, okay? Um, 
general purposes, I, uh, kind of general numbers, the diamond table has about 140 million uh, uh, PSI for Young's modulus. Uh, the tux of carbide backing right here, the substrate's about 90 million. And the steel and or the tux and carbide matrix for, a, for a, a, a matrix bit is around 30 million. So just by reference here. So, so this guy is, is stiff. And if I load it hard enough, now I don't uh, think of tungsten carbide as squishy, but again, my Oreo cookie example, this is the squishy stuff here. And it's the foundation, if the foundation is not thick enough, or if I've, I just overload it with enough load, eventually I'm going to break this guy, right? So there's things that I can do to make sure that this is as tough as possible. Actually, I don't do any of that work. The, the cutter guys do on behalf, and, and they talk to the big guys, and they do all that work. But, but we can recognize it and then, and then charge them off on the trail to go and fix it and make it better, right? Um, so if I, if I structurally overload in this direction, that's that tangential cutter fracture damage. Uh, and you see a crack here that hasn't um, propagated all the way through. There's my plastic hinge. Here are some examples of this. There's my plastic hinge right back here. This one's multiple hits. This is, looks like a single event to me. Uh, this one looks like a whole bunch of different events that tend to show up with jump damage and things. Uh, and then here's uh, something in between. I've got a few hits here in the, uh, in the edge, but it looks like one major event right here. So uh, remember that first bit we showed you that was the uh, one one? Here's the... Uh, Here's that cutter on the nose that we told you. I told you it was a broken cutter on the nose. The nice thing is now I know that this was tangential overload. Now, when it's tangential overload on the nose, uh, that's very likely of drilling into a hard formation and taking too big of a depth of cut. So I structurally overloaded that cutter. Uh, I can either get better cutters, uh, better bit design with more blades and more, more to keep from overloading it, or I can reduce the maximum depth of cut when I'm entering into that hard formation. So um, you know, there's, there's several ways that I can control that. But the key thing is, I, you know, just looking at a 1-1 one, one without a photograph doesn't really help me. I really need to know that that's not just a broken cutter, that that is a tangential direction as opposed to that spalling direction. Way different corrective actions that I'm going to take. A couple of more examples of tangential fracture right here on the shoulder. Uh, again, out here on the outside. And then this one's spalled right here. This one's, this one's damaged and spalling. All right. So... Here's a, here's a video uh, animation from Baker Hughes from several years ago. Uh, if you know that you have typically, uh, this is the, sorry, this is the load uh, on the cutter versus cutter number. And we're gonna animate here in a second. Uh, the load is highest in the center because I have the fewest number of blades and the widest spacing on the cutters. Uh, so the load per cutter is high in the center. All right, but they uh, but their travel distance is low, so they don't tend to wear out. But they can break. Now, if I uh, if I drill into something hard, and we're gonna we're gonna have a orange formation show up here in a second that uh, that is hard, and you're gonna see that we're gonna get a spike here. This is actually the spike is just starting because there's a little bit of orange showing through. So I'm gonna go ahead and animate this, and let it run. So as it as it goes through, I'm drilling into the orange formation. The first few cutters that hit, it gets overloaded right here. And then as the bit drills more and more of that hard rock, all right, the whole thing starts to, the whole bit starts to slow down because I'm drilling hard rock. And it comes back to the same profile that I had originally. So eventually this will come back to the same average load profile that I had before. But in the transition, I get this overload in the nose. Now, uh, there's a similar transition that if, I, if, if this were hard rock and gray and the orange were soft rock, this would be a very low load and I'd have peaks on the in, uh, inside and peaks on the, on the outside. Uh, I'm sorry, this is inside and that's outside, but I'd have, I'd have uh, overload on, on the inside and the outside. And uh, Ty Cunningham and Fred DePriest and Sam and a few others have, have written a, a good paper on that. And I wrote a paper on drilling uh, in through interventions as well. There's a couple of papers to talk about and kind of this in a little bit more detail too. So, so uh, there's a, there's a discussion around, is it fracture toughness or is it fracture resistance? I tend today coming down to the fracture toughness uh, story. Uh, if I have an existing crack, notice there's cracks here, little thumbnail cracks here, here, here. 
There's a little one right there and right there starting to form. Uh, I've got cracks in the, in the material that's hard and brittle, and I haven't propagated it yet all the way through. So we've got West Texas where we're doing some pretty hard stuff, and, uh, and in Oklahoma, and we can get these kind of fractures on the front face. And that's that tangential load. Uh, is it, there's some thermal component, could be as well, but uh, the, the key thing that I'm looking for is I know the load direction is in this direction right here. And, uh, and fracture toughness is the energy that, it's a measure of the energy that it takes to propagate a crack. So I have existing cracks, they haven't completely failed yet. And uh, so I tend to, right now, tend to think that fracture toughness is the property that I really want to pay attention to on, on cutters. And again, loaded in the tangential direction. So, you know, if I if I keep adding weight, we always say, hey, add weight, you know, drill faster, add weight, drill faster, uh, until you get into some dysfunction. If you're drilling a uniform rock, you'll core out the center. Why? Because those cutters in the center are loaded the highest. Um, it is. Uh, uh, it's going to tend to core out. That's true for a rotor cone bit as well, right? Uh, this one hasn't completely cored out, but if you see all of these cutters in the center are broken, so we have exceeded the structural limit of that uh, of that particular bit, right? So if it's if it's inside the cone, it's a uniform rock and it's overloaded structurally. If it's out on the nose, it's you know look at interfacial severity, look at drilling through interbedded formations. Uh, it could also be drill out damage. If I leave anything in the hole, uh, it's going to lay on the bottom of the hole and it'll typically be if it, and vertical, it'll be right on the nose. What do you do when you reach the structural limit? Redesign the limiter, man. Don't. Uh, that, that doesn't uh, don't take your toys and go home. Sit down and say, all right, what can I do? Can I can I fuss at the bit manufacturers and ask them to to come up with a uh, a better cutter that's more structurally uh, more structural integrity? And again, notice this fracture direction right here is in that tangential direction. When you talk to the vendor, don't just say. Uh, Give me your toughest cutter because it might be measured in the as falling resistance, right? So you want the toughest cutter measured in that tangential direction, not the not the small resistance. They're different. Uh, painful experience there to 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 say just because somebody says this is my new toughest cutter, and just ask and what direction did you load it? So and and is it fracture toughness and or is it fracture resistance? I'm going to leave that one open for, uh, there's several people in the industry that are, that are arguing over that one. And that, and that may, uh, I may change my mind on that one, but right now I'm down in the, the uh, fracture toughness world, but uh, okay. All right. Uh, let's talk about redesign the limiter. Look at these, look at these cutters right here. They're short substrate. Compare that length of that substrate to this one out here, right? So these, these cutters right here are, these in the center. I broke three of the five short substrate cutters, and I didn't any of these long ones. And it's just like having a, a thin foundation under your house. It's much more likely to crack. So don't use short substrates in the center. Okay. Uh, look at this cutter size to the compared to the next one right next to it. These small cutters inside the center. Seven out of seven of them broke. Uh, so let's don't do that anymore, right? I can redesign that limiter and get rid of that. The, the, why would smaller cutters break? Because for a given depth of cut, I've got more of the diamond table uh, exposed and, and they typically are shorter from front to back as well. So small cutters are, as a general rule, are less tough than larger cutters. And certainly, certainly short substrate cutters are, are definitely less tough. Uh, even these two-piece cutters, like this is this bond right here that's right here, uh, is typically less tough than a single substrate, right? But I can, in any, in, no matter what I do, uh, the the key thing is work with your vendors and and let them work with their vendors uh, to sit down and say, how am I going to get a better toughness out of this, and uh, and make sure that they're engaged on measuring the toughness in the direction you care about. Uh, here's two blades to center, okay? And by the way, all these are short, 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 short. Finally get long out here with only two blades to center. So, and you can see I broke all of these guys. Um, uh, they're, they're chipped and broken. And normally I wouldn't see that. The, the fix for this is let's go to three blades to center and let's, uh, uh, let's go with the longer substrate so I don't have that, right? So 
and do I have to wait for this? I, I used to, I'd say, oh, it shows up. Now we'll, uh, let's redo, do a redesign. Why do I even accept the very first bit in the first place? So uh, ExxonMobil, we have a, a checklist for drill bits, just like we do for stabilizers. Uh, the checklist has not been published yet. I'm hoping to be able to do that in the next few years. But we today, we haven't published that checklist. But I just to tell you, one of the things for sure is we look for three blades to center. We look for long substrate cutters and no short, sub, no small cutters on the inside. Why? Because we know that all of those break eventually. Uh, it may not break at the application we're in today. We may not be there. But, but if I get it redesigned, if there's no downside to having three blades to center and there's no downside to having long substrates. So I don't really have to make a design trade off there. Uh, and, you know, how do, we just talked about three blades to center, short substrates, avoid short substrate, avoid small cutters, work with vendors, get the, the best tangential fractness, uh, tangential fracture toughness cutter that they have available. So uh, I, I'm in drilling tank. Well, that means call me uh, or somebody else in our group here for help uh, to engage uh, vendors if you need to. Uh, what's kind of the structural limit we're running today? Eight and a half inch uh, PDC drill bit with uh, three blades centered, long substrate, 16 mils, which are which have been through a lot of development work. Uh, 77,000 pounds weight on bit measured at the surface, 50,000 pounds downhole, which probably at times was 77,000 downhole. That was our that was our structural limit where we at the end of the run we said, well, what is it going to take to break this bit? And we actually intentionally went up to 77,000 pounds on the eight and a half. Uh, so that we could back up and then say, all right, don't run 77, run 75 <laughs> or whatever. The, what, but it, but you know, we had been living with those those uh, recommendations that say, oh, don't go over 35 or don't go over 40 or whatever. And I think you see that we're, we're well past that today. Uh, okay, so remember this load direction. This is based on the SPE paper. Uh, 199598 and it's it's the stress in this cutter is dependent on on uh, not only load uh, but also a concentration of load but the load direction as well and I'll just let you read that paper um, all right so if we have uh, the Oreo cookie break, right? Uh, you may hear me call that a lot but, but to tangential fracture toughness if I break cutters on the inside of the nose, uh, inside the cone, sorry, that is going to be uh, most likely it's going to be drill out damage, excessive weight on bit, or stick slip. The stick slip, the when I go to the stick phase, dynamically I'm going, I still have dynamic weight on bit. So before I have uh, intermittently very high weight on bit as the bit comes to a stop. So my depth of cut is going real high and I can, I can break these cutters with stick slip uh, uh, inside the cone. Uh, I also drill out damage because I may have typically I've got a float valve or something, those pieces of steel and and, uh, and springs and whatever else I may have uh, can damage that inside the cone. If, if it's out here on the outside, okay, if I damage these gauge trimmers, right, and I break them and that Oreo cookie break, think about whirl inside a casing. It can fall or it can break them in half, just depends on whether I get any sliding motion or whether I just am, am walking around the inside, okay? If it's on the nose, okay, if it's on the nose, uh, think about hard formation transition, drilling into, uh, into a hard formation, or double check and make sure it's not junk damage again. Uh, usually you won't see junk damage in the in one in the middle of the run, uh, certainly not in a long lateral. Um, but if you're the first, if it's the, you just tag bottom and you got an early failure, uh, certainly that's what I start looking for and see if there was something that might've either fallen off the last bit or I pushed it down hole. And of course it can get embedded in the hole and then show up later in the well as well. So. Uh, if it's just outside the nose, I can have a hard formation transition with a bedding angle, right? So I've done, we have that situation show up because again, we're not always drilling vertical to the, to or no, uh, perpendicular to the bedding planes. Uh, if I have it random, one on the inside, one on the outside here, you know, kind of all over, um, it can be interfacial severity because of, again, 
I, uh, I underload the nose and I overload these outside. Uh, it can also be chert and pyrite and vomerants, anything that might show up randomly across the face of the bed. It wouldn't necessarily be in any one spot. Okay. And I have one special case uh, that is you know, on a secondary blade. So here's a Here's the first cutter on the secondary blade, and here's my nozzle. What can happen is, usually it's not broken on the on the uh, cutting profile, but it's broken on the inside, and it's due to erosion. So what I do, this one hasn't broken yet, but you can see the erosion right here where I'm eroding the backing away, and, and this due to this nozzle wash right here, and it's going to break, eventually break that cutter. So, so just be aware that sometimes you'll see a fracture damage that you need to look at the underlying cause and the fix for that. Go get the go get the uh, bit vendor to redesign the hydraulics, or or you might need to clean up the mud and get lower, less solids in your mud. Uh, I I'm loath to ever recommend that you drop the flow rate. I suspect it's more around solids control and maybe a little bit of a design issue that you can that you almost always you can take care of that today. So, uh, okay, good time for questions. Yeah, we've had a few questions, Paul, but um, Dustin is doing a great job of answering. The technical okay. questions. Um, right. So I think we can keep going. Excellent. Good. All right. I'm not going to do this learnings check. Um, just to let you know, these are kind of questions that uh, that we would ask. So now we're going to do rip wear scars, and uh, and again, we're going to determine the direction of motion uh, and what surfaces are in contact, and some idea of the particle size. So. You know, here's here's the one thing. If I, so, my deal was take your piece of chalk, run it against a piece of uh, 220 grit sandpaper, fine grain, and you'll see these real fine uh, striations. If you take 60 grit, you'll see these coarse stri striations. Now, these are like uh, icebergs. Only a little piece of the of the grain is what's uh, uh, doing the damage, and the rest is buried in the in the rock matrix. But you get the idea here. I can see this. And by the way, this is a great example where lighting matters. So my lighting direction is over here coming down and it highlights these shadows. It's perpendicular to the wear scars. It's a lot easier to see than here's my lighting direction and it's almost in parallel to the wear scars. So good example of, of uh, paying attention to the lighting direction to highlight some of that, okay? Um, but very clearly, I can tell something about the grain size. Now, what happens if I run against something that's hard and not very abrasive? And I'm taking a piece of paper here or cardboard in that case, right? Of a binder. So I'm gonna I'm gonna rub that chalk against the binder. And and if I rub it back and forth, what happens is it doesn't it, uh, normally normal wear, I carry the heat away with the grain. So the 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 uh, coarse grain material like a sandstone it will carry the heat away and I won't see heat checking. But if I run against something that's hard, but not abrasive, think of limestone, some of the hard shales, uh, I, can, I can generate a lot of heat. And, uh, and I'm trying to wear, I'm, I'm not putting a lot of load on it, all right? I'm generating a lot of friction, but it is not, is not carrying the heat away in the, in the abrasive particle. So, so what happens, the heat goes up into the, into the cutter and that's when I will see heat checking. So, so um, we'll get to the, we'll show you a couple of examples of heat checking in a, just a second. Here's, here's, think about this in terms of smooth cutter wear. So the smooth cutter wear is a function of the contact pressure, which is the rock strength, right? Uh, and it's independent of depth of cut. Why is that? I, I, and I, we, we can have a little argument here, and, and Mark Dykstra and I and, and Dustin, a few others have had some discussions around this, uh, Isabel Whitnoring as well, about, you, you know, as I run a higher depth of cut, yes, I do put more energy into the, uh, into the rock, but the, but the contact pressure here is still rock strength. By definition, it can't push any harder than the rock strength. And what's happening is when I, when I do this cutting action, right, oops, I thought I was going to play that again. Uh, the sliding that goes underneath here that generates that wear flat, that's what's adding heat to the system. I'm carrying away a lot of heat with this ribbon. The, the material that's cutting, that's being cut, is carrying heat away with it. So that's really not bad for me. I don't really 
generate a lot more heat with, if I double the depth of cut, I don't double the heat generated, okay? Uh, at least the heat going into the cutter. It's, it's really much more dependent on this wear flat. So when I see smooth wear like this, right, uh, primarily we think about it as being a function of sliding distance. And I'll talk about the cutter temperature here in a second. So think about it this way. So if I, uh, if I drill uh, 100 feet at 120 RPM, the outside of an eight and a half inch drill bit at 100, at 100 feet an hour, it's going to slide 16,000 feet, go round, round, round 16,000 feet. At 32,000, at 50 feet an hour, it's going to go 32,000 feet. So the sliding distance went up when I drilled slower. Hmm. How do I know this is uh, uh, true? How do I know that sliding distance is important? Well, I got several graphs in the, in the lab to show this too, but look at the wear on the outside and you see that there's a lot more wear on the outside and essentially nothing on the inside. The sliding distance in here is much less than it is out here. Remember the load in the side is a lot higher than it is on the outside. And uh, we can talk about cooling. We know these cutters are going to be hotter out here as well. So there is a, there is a cooling effect. We'll get to that as well. But, but I believe primarily that the sliding distance out here is, is driving you, uh, in many cases, is driving you to the smooth wear. We'll, we'll show some examples of thermal damages. And all that. Okay. So here's a couple of examples in, the, in a laboratory of uh, uh, two different mud types. Here's water. And here's a xanthium gum, and you see that the temperature goes up, and, and as the temperature goes up, it generates a wear flat, and then it starts going nonlinear here as, as that temperature is wear beget more wear, if you will. Uh, so you think about uh, the heat capacity of the mud, taking it away, high, high flow rates, good hydraulics, uh, high linear velocity around the, uh, the cutter for the fluid is, is good for cleaning and, and cooling. But also as the wear flat goes up, uh, it's gonna go nonlinear. Look here, I was going on the same path and then I started generating a wear flat. Once I generate a wear flat, the temperature goes up, the wear goes up, the wear flat goes up, the temperature goes up and it just goes this, this exponential growth here. So here's, here's an example of, of uh, you know, just a distance. You can see this is linear with sliding distance. Uh, this one is very clearly nonlinear uh, because of the heat generating, okay? Um, if I increase the rare, the RPM, I can increase increase the sliding speed, and of course, as they go to the OD, both of those will give me a higher sliding speed, and and a potentially more wear, right? Because of that. Uh, again, we can talk about local velocity of the mud to help uh, cool it. The rock strength is going to be the same at, at, uh, across the whole bit, but but certainly uh, the harder and more abrasive the rock is, the more wear, the more temperature I'm going to get. I actually look back up, uh, the, the harder it is, not the more abrasive. Abrasive formations like sandstones tend to carry heat away from the wear flat. I get that diamond lip we used to talk about. Uh, Non-abrasive like limestones, I can get a lot of heat into the cutters. So I can get a lot of thermal damage in a, in a real fine grain material and or uh, a hard uh, a surface that doesn't, uh, it's not abrasive. Okay. Uh, the depth of cut is is important in the sense that uh, yes, it will it will generate more heat, but the temperature increases only slightly as a because the ribbon carries most of the heat away. Okay, and then of course I've, I have two different cutter types: one that's thermally stable uh, is going to be along this more linear line; one that's less thermally stable at those uh, and it's a relative grade, right? Uh, this one I've overheated and I've got it up to its uh, stability limit and it's, it's starting to generate wet. Okay, uh, here's an example of the sliding speed. Here's a slower sliding speed and a higher sliding speed. And you see what happened here. We burned this out uh, very quickly. This is uh, some test data from NOV uh, that they kind of share, but you can see what happened here very, very quickly. Um, I increased beyond the thermal limit and, and this thing went exponential. What does that tell you? If I'm at hard rock, how do I do a hard rock? Let's see. Higher weight on bit, higher depth of cut to reduce the sliding distance and lower RPM. That's my that's my rule today. We know that already. Most most of the cases, 
Uh, now, what, what limits me, uh, how far I can go in that direction, it would be stick slip, uh, dynamics, maybe structural integrity of the, of the cutters. Uh, so I can, I can overload the cutter. Um, I always seem to have food analogies here, but, uh, you know, you got your potato chip and you dip it into the bean dip or whatever, and your, or your, your, uh, guacamole or whatever, and you're, you take too much, right. And, uh, and, and it breaks. Okay. You've exceeded the structural integrity of that potato chip. Yeah. If you back up a little bit and just take a little bit less, you can less of a depth of cut, but you can slide it farther. You can still get the same amount of guacamole. Uh, so the, the idea is go, go higher on the depth of cut up to the structural integrity limit uh, instead of going higher on speed if it's hard rock. That's, the, that's typically the better way to drill. Here's a couple of other examples where I got a little break in and here's my linear where is a uh, and as a function of the sliding distance and then I go nonlinear. Uh, I do want to point out this guy right here. You see this this little thermal mechanical damage right here. We're going to see that again in just a half second. So watch this. You see the front is just smooth wear here and this is the uh, it looks like smooth wear. But there's some thermal effects going on as I as I'm starting to get up in this range. Okay. Um, smooth wear, uh, and you see these little spalling of the front, the micro spalls around the front. That also is an indication of thermal damage as well. This is it may be hard to tell little chipping and micro spalls from coral damage. Uh, again, it's a lot of times going to occur on the outside, but typically you'll see this once you have big wear flat. So you, I've got a lot of heat coming into this cutter, and I'm going to have thermal damage, thermal effects. So it is a combination of thermal and mechanical. All right. Uh, again, same thing. I, I've got it down here on the uh, 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 shoulder. You see, this cutter is nowhere at all. And this one's halfway worn. Suggests that I had some kind of localized damage here, probably due to whirl. Uh, and then I wore it, and then I wore it with a big enough wear flat that I'm starting to see thermal. So, you know, my 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 path to see what I see here is mechanical damage because this one's damaged, this one's not. I mean, zero. It's not a. It's, it's a. It's a night and day thing. So I think I damaged it mechanically. Then I wore the wear flats, and then now that the wear flats are big enough, I start to see the thermal. Okay. Uh, you remember that uh, that little little stuff that we saw in the laboratory test? Here's a field uh, cutter that shows this exact same thing, and then notice the heat check marks here that I've, I've got. So this is uh, thermal fatigue that's going on. Um, it is. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, running up against something, and I, if I look real closely, I can see the direction of the wear. Okay, and it's by the way, it's not perpendicular to the face. Suggests that this bit's running a little bit off center as well. So, heat checking on tungsten carbide uh, inserts on a rotor cone, and heat checking here as well. So the heat checking is is telling me it's a non-abrasive hard formation, at least at the end of the run. It might have been something else earlier. It might have been that I damaged it mechanically, uh, but at the end of the run, I, this is what I see. All right. So when do I stop adding weight? Okay. Well, if I if I add weight, it will reduce the sliding distance. Uh, all right. So. Stop adding weight when I fracture the cutters, okay, in the cutting direction. That's that, me that mechanical limit. Uh, I add weight early, not after the wear flat forms. Once, if I, if I wait, and uh, if I wait to add weight, if I, if I put lightweight at first and then put heavy weight later, when I've got a wear flat, I'm generating heat like crazy. It's, got, it's already done. I've already, once I've generated the wear flat, the wear is going to go uh, not, uh, asym, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of uh, exponential go up, right? So, so what I want to do is I want to um, add weight early, not at the end of the run, okay? And again, I want to I want to control the fracture toughness, or control the uh, the load to be within the fracture toughness limits of the cutter. When do I reduce RPM? Okay, there's a rule: we're going to go higher RPM whenever we can. The only times I would reduce RPM if you see thermal damage, and only until you redesign the limiter. If you can get a better cutter that has better better thermal resistance, you would do that. Uh, you can have uh, extra nozzles out here on the outside, redesign the fluid flow to get better cleaning and cooling. Maybe you just run higher flow rates. Um, 
you know, there's a whole bunch of things to do that you can redesign, but you, you know what, you don't want to stay at that low RPM if you can overcome it by redesigning. It. Okay. And the same thing for, you know, you only add uh, weight and, uh, and only until the limiter can be redesigned. If I got a new cutter that's tougher in terms of fracture toughness, then I'll do that. Okay. Uh, how are we doing on time, by the way? Can we give me a time check? Yeah, we've got about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 20 minutes to go. Um, we did okay. have a question here about when you were talking about hard rock, Paul, what sort of compressive strength are you referring to? So uh, today, I, uh, my, my uh, hard rock soft rock boundary has changed as cutter technologies improved. It used to be around 10 or 15,000 PSI. I, anything uh, softer than that, I would consider soft rock, easy to drill. Now remember, concrete your sidewalks are, are 5,000 PSI. So, you know, it, it, this is all relative. To what we consider could old cement to be quite drillable. The chert maybe not, but but cement is. So, so today I'm I'm saying something around 15 to 20,000. So, so that boundary I I tend to see. I can have whirl, I can have uh, a lot of uh, drill string dynamics events, and the cutter survived today in 15,000 PSI rock and softer, maybe even up to 20,000. Uh, so, so I may not see all of this damage in the soft rock, even though I'm, I can detect it from stick slip and whirl from the MW tools that I've got in the ground or, or these uh, uh, modules, the, the record only modules that I've got in the ground with the drill bit. So uh, just because they're telling me I'm whirling may, may not be damaging the cutters. Now damaging connections, they're damaging electronics, they're shaking the, the pieces, your, your bearings on your mud motor, they're shaking, the, they're loading up uh, MWE tools. So it doesn't mean you don't need to get rid of them, but your, your, your cutter toughness is, is high enough today. You may not be able to detect it just from that. So you need to look a little more subtly at wear scars on the backs of the blades and, and, and other wear scars that are telling you that you're vibrating as well, particularly if you don't have that MWE tool. So, Anything over 20,000 PSI and harder is in my hard rock kind of country. That's the stuff that I start seeing damage real quickly. Okay, thank you, Paul. I'll give you another time check when there's five minutes to go. All right, excellent. All right. So, uh, oh, this was, oh, sorry. Uh, we drill two times the compressive strength and we double the weight. What happens to ROP? ROP is the same. I'm, I'm making it all in here. What happens to wear? The wear goes up two times because I have the same sliding and two times the strength, right? So, so a harder rock's going to wear more. I can't prevent that. But uh, what happens if I drill a three times compressive strength rock with the same parameters? What happens to ROP? What's a third, right? Makes sense. ROP drops one third, but the wear goes up nine times. I've got three times the sliding distance and three times the strength of the rock. So my wear goes up dramatically. And that was, if I didn't make any change, it really goes up. So 30,000 PSI rocks gonna give me a lot more damage than 10,000 PSI rock. That's just a given. And by the way, if I don't do anything, if I don't respond, if I don't add weight to reduce the sliding distance in that hard rock, it's gonna be even worse. So here's the, here's the case of doing something Here's the case of, of not doing anything. It gets a lot worse. Uh, okay, keep going. So material selection uh, from a vendor standpoint, uh, we can we can look at smooth wear resistance. Uh, if you ever see any of that, let me know. It's kind of rare. Uh, it's, we, we usually do fracture deafness, and we, we look at, at this tangential fracture. This is my number one thing today. This is, the, this is what I see more often than anything else is this uh, tangential fracture failure, and, uh, and I select cutters primarily for fracture toughness. We do see actual uh, fracture toughness is falling events. It still shows up from time to time. Usually I go around and say, well, we did something wrong to allow the bit to whirl in our connection practice or something, and, and we try to avoid that or connections or, or tagging bottom. Uh, this thermal stability where you see the uh, you see the little micro spalls and all that, that's a big deal as well. We certainly see that as well. Um, and uh, but but don't see a lot of smooth wear. We do see these two primarily. Why do I see more of this today? It's because I run highway on bit. I tend to run 
up to the structural limit. And we don't, uh, as we would say, dilly daddle around. We uh, we get on with it. We we don't let the bit whirl uh, on a connection practice as much as possible. We we try to avoid that, and uh, and that means we're running up against the structural limit all the time. And we will either break it like this, or we will go overload. Uh, erosion, uh, you see these erosion marks here. Uh, this is that soft kind of cloudy look. It's not, doesn't have a, it doesn't have a uh, uh, real directional, if, if you will, to the, uh, to the path. You can't see the wear scars themselves like you would if it was a wear scar. And, but you can see, like in this case, you can see this little stagnation point and the material flowed around the inside and the outside, okay? All right, we can fix that with uh, the guys with the computational fluid dynamics. They can reorient nozzles, change the direction and the flow. This hot spot right here is this hot spot. You see that uh, uh, they're pretty good about being able to tell where the uh, uh, where the fluid is likely to erode, and uh, can usually avoid that to begin with today. And if not, if you start pulling bells like this, get your vendors to to sit down and redesign the. the and you all, you do something too if you're an operator you need to look at your uh, your mud system and make sure you're solid in the truck. Uh, cutter corrosion uh, you see these little pitting marks here and pitting behind the, the diamond table this is a high stress zone uh, it's a, a layer of diluted uh, cobalt typically and so it's going to be a real high residual stress in this area and it's going to have uh, corrosion here's the deal it's almost not ever a life limiting factor. Even though you've been, you're damaging the cutter substrate here, it's not life limiting to the drill bit. But boy, it is to a whole bunch of other stuff. If I see this kind of pitting, even though I haven't pulled the motor out, guess what? This uh, this is pitting. This is uh, corrosion pitting to the uh, to the rotor in a motor. And I haven't pulled this apart yet, right? I'm just looking at this, but I need to fix this right now because it's probably doing this to my motor. Uh, it's doing that to my drill pipe, uh, to my MWD uh, 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 signaling valves, everything else. So if I've got stress corrosion or corrosion going on, I need to probably go back and look at my mud. And, and, uh, I, and so I was talking to the cutter vendors about this and, and I said, and I'm not going to fuss at you. When I see this corrosion, it means that everything in my system has got corrosion issues. I won't go fuss at the mud guys and and see what we're doing there and uh, and see if we've got our corrosion inhibitors in place uh, that we're getting oxygen scavengers and things like that squared away. With. Because yes, let's say the cutter vendor can fix this and yeah, they do work on it. You ask them to, they'll do that, right? But did you, did now you're going to have to go ask the motor guy to fix this, and then you're going to have to go ask the pipe guy to put liners on the inside of this pipe, and then you're going to, and it goes on and on and on. Why don't you just add a little bit of corrosion inhibitor to the mud, get the mud guy to get it fixed, and they'll it'll solve all of these in one one day. So again, this is an example of this IDC code, the, the forensics work, informing you about something, not about redesigning the vet, but about redesigning your system. Okay. All right, so uh, we just have a few minutes left, which is good. We don't need a lot of time, but I want to talk about uh, wear scars on VHAs. And uh, so, you know, if we if we have reverse bit whirl, we walk around the inside of the hole. You can imagine why we damaged the outside of this, this bit here. You see this wear scar right here. It's really unusual. It's on that upper part of the pad and this lower part of the pad. Uh, now, this bit was pulled from the field, but this is a lab test, Baker Hughes uh, lab test of, uh, of the bit that's whirling. And this whirl pattern is a six-bladed, uh, a six-sided whirl pattern. It was a five-bladed bit. And as it's whirling, it's slowly progressing. So I'm spiraling or rifling the hole as that pattern you know, it's whirling like crazy, and then, but it's the orientation of the pattern is slowly changing, which is why it gave me this wear scar right here. So just realize the key thing that I want you to think about, if you see a wear scar, it means it was in contact. If it was in contact, you got to figure out the motion and, and realize that the motion is not always rotating smoothly on center. Everything is right, right? That's, that's the key. Uh, this bit is uh, what we call forward whirl. It's actually more wear on this side than it is on this side. Uh, if you look at this bit in the lab, uh, 
there's a splashing mud right here, and then I've got a gap. That's about a quarter of an inch of gap over here, and then it's pushed up against the Warhol wall on this side, right? So, so this bit is in forward whirl or jump rope motion, and this bit in the field, this is a, a field bit, a very short run, by the way. The mud, I mean, I haven't even worn out the uh, paint yet, but a uh, very short run, and it's just forward whirl, okay? Remember that bit we showed earlier? Uh, different wear scar on this side of the bit versus this other side. That's uneven uh, wear on the in individual blades. It tells me it's forward whirl. Okay, I can have forward whirl on drill pipe and on BHAs as well. So, uh, hopefully most of you guys have seen this video from Silver Jay. Uh, it's a lab test where they uh, they run the pipe. They've actually lubricated this idea of, a, of this casing ring. And what do you see is, you see this thing is jump rope motion. One side of the, of the drill collar is up against the borehole wall. Look at this wear scar right here. It's one side is worn away. Uh, here's a here's a VHA that is being uh, disassembled in the lab and, or in the shop. And there's the wear scar here, and here's the wear scar. And because they just started to unscrew it, you can see how how deep that wear scar is. Uh, here's a uh, an isolation uh, uh, segment of uh, of the sonic tool. It looks like, uh, and you can see the wear on one side right here. So <clears throat> if you see <clears throat> Excuse me. If you see wear on one side of the BHA, think about bending of the BHA and eccentric BHA wear scars. That's due to forward whirl, jump rope motion. <clears throat> Remember that stabilizer? Uh, this was forward whirl. That's what we talked about, right? Uh, we uh, uh, we didn't do anything about it. We put the exact same BHA, different stabilizers, different serial numbers. But we put the exact same setup into the ground, and we did it again. And guess what we got? Same thing. Oh, it, it was now again arbitrary. But here's blade one. Blade two is not touched. Blade three is worn out. So. I've, I've pushed up against the side of the hole. So I got the same results twice with forward whirl. What should I have done? Change the rotary speed, change the spacing of the stabilizers. Uh, I should have done something different. Didn't recognize it at the time. We pulled one out and, and, and this is a, I think this is a real good point. This happens to be a run out of Kazakhstan. Um, if I had diagnosed this in the field on the rig floor, well, I could have made that corrective action. By the time the pictures got back into the Houston, we had to look at it and decide what to do about it. Uh, you know, it was a bit late. So, you know, we'd already run the second BHA in the ground and we were already drilling with it. And sure enough, it came out like this. So we didn't really have uh, the, the, we didn't shorten the, the uh, analyze cycle enough. And again, that's why we want to do that on the rig floor whenever possible. Uh, how bad can it get? <clears throat> Uh, wedge thread uh, or some kind of a compression thread here. And you can see I've worn a tool joint all the way down. Yes, tool joints go into forward whirl as well. Uh, this stabilizer used to have a blade out here like this. And uh, and this actually, this picture showed up uh, my very first week of work at ExxonMobil. So somebody sent me a picture and they said, uh, hey, what happened here? And I said, well, I can tell you exactly what happened. It's forward whirl. Uh, we wore a jump rope motion. It's on one side of the hole. I mean, we know exactly what happened. And then they said, now, how do you fix it? I went, oh, I don't really know. So at the time, we didn't have, at least I wasn't aware of the, of the work we had been doing on vibes to, uh, to suppress forward whirl. And uh, again, I could change the rotary speed and I know I should be able to get out of that. I can change the spacing of the stabilizers. Uh, and Jeff Bailey has a distinguished lecture series on this very soft subject uh, about how you tune a BHA so that you don't get into these, uh, these events. So. A reverse whirl. Uh, you see this damage where we're, uh, uh, we've got all this this indentation damage. This is the uh, again. Here's the here's the uh, video from Summer's Day for reverse whirl. All they did is they added a little sand to the idea of this thing, and so we increased the friction. And if I increase the friction enough, instead of going in that nice forward whirl motion, I'm gearing around the inside of the hole. Uh, 
the, this particular tool, they actually de, they deformed the tool plastically. So you can see heat coming off of this thing. I'm jittering a lot. You can see I've actually shaken this, the bolts loose of this thing here. So uh, again, when I see these indentations, it means that I'm walking around on top of a bunch of junk as well. So there's some junk in the hole as well, probably uh, bits of cutters and tons of carbide and things like that. Here's a, here's a rotor cone. There's only one tooth left, kind of snaggle tooth, but you can see this uh, uh, reverse world damage on the OD. Okay, one, one more example. Now, this is interesting. Is this forward world or reverse world? I've got the bottom of the stabilizer is, is worn all the way around uniform. So it's not forward world. It's not jump rope motion. It's not reverse world because if it was banging against the side, I would have broken this little lip here. Uh, here it is. This is the stabilizer still screwed on to this uh, diamond bit from a few years ago. Uh, the diamond bit's in full gauge, and this is under gauge right here. And then this is back to full gauge. So when you see something like this where it's worn from particularly the bottom up, you can also see it's worn a little bit from the top down, probably back bending away on hope. What we see is it's usually due to borehole spiraling. Now I've animated the borehole so you can see the spiral as this goes along. And you think about this, this would be like I'm hitting a ledge, except that I it, one ledge wouldn't do this amount of four inches of damage. But what happens is I've got a continuous ledge as I'm trying to drill down. And as I go down, that ledge goes from one side of the, of the stabilizer there, but I'm rotating it. So I've got this continuous ledge eating my stabilizer from the bottom up. Okay, so when I see wear like that, I immediately look for borehole spiraling effects. Okay, even this small amount of damage like this, this is, you know, somebody say, oh yeah, I got a little bit of damage right here. Uh, I've got a little bit more damage right here. I, in fact, I've worn all the way almost off. If this had gone just another, you know, 10% more, this would have been worn off and I might've just said, oh, that's just hard rock. No, nah, man. It, yeah, it is hard and it's abrasive, but it's most importantly, it's a spiraling effect. I'm, I'm eating my way upward as I go down. Right? And even if it's really subtle, I start paying attention to stuff like this. This is, a, this is the point about taking pictures of perfectly good stabilizers. Somebody would say, oh, that's normal. Don't worry about that. No, man, this right here is telling me that I'm overloading this end, which means that I've got to think every time you see that, even that, you've got some kind of a spiral effect. And you're damaging this bottom edge more so preferentially than the other. You got some spiraling going on. So you can do something about it now before it gets so bad that you can't get out of the hole. We're down to four minutes, Paul. Very good. Thank you. So how bad can it get? Uh, I love these. Jess Greenwood shared these with me a few years ago. I love this one. Uh, I particularly like this guy's face right here. Uh, he's going, how in the hell did we get this out of the ground? I'm saying, how the heck did we get this out of the ground? Uh, natural diamond bit. This is a turbine, okay? Uh, this is the uh, a bearing housing stabilizer for the turbine. Here's the output shaft, I think, as this is the output shaft on the turbine. And, and then this was some kind of a crossover sub, and then this used to be the extended gauge on the bit, right? This wasp waist right here means that I had this spiral pattern. I probably was laying out at an angle. What's interesting, you see the, you see the, the ledge that I formed here as well. And then if you look closely, there's a little bit of a wear up here. So there's a zone that is not worn. Here's a zone that it is worn right here. And, and so just think about it. It's, it's up against the hole and then it's away and then it's up against the hole and it's away. So this is that sinusoidal uh, or, or helical uh, borehole pattern that is going on. And, um, uh, and, and, and you can see the ledge right here being formed on the stabilizer. So uh, the fact that we got this out of the ground is quite amazing to me. But, but again, how bad can it get? It can get pretty bad, as this guy tells you. Uh, here's another different BHA, but it's got this, this uh, ledge right here. Again, even a small ledge like that is uh, concerned. Okay. Um, if I, if I bend in torsion, remember we, if we bend in torsion, we get a 45 degree chamfer like this, uh, a 45 degree. So you see pipe that's, uh, that's 
uh, failed in torsion and it will be a 45 degree kind of uh, failure line. If it's just a horizontal crack uh, perpendicular to the axis, that's usually bending. The angle of the crack is uh, near zero. And uh, one of my most favorites because it's showing up a lot these days is um, HFTO kind of cracks. So here's my 45 degree crack, suggest torsion, but notice that it goes both ways. So I've got, I've got torsion going forward and backwards. Uh, this is in a, uh, a MWD uh, housing uh, inside. And then this is the inside of an MWD tool. You see the X8 crack right here. And this is the API pin connection of a drill bit right here. And it's got a bunch of other stuff going on, but you know, this little X-shaped crack right here tells me that I had HFTOs. I had stress reversals going on within the DHA, not stick slip. The normal stick slip is a low frequency thing. The drill string is in, uh, yeah, uh, in torsion, all right, but it is always, almost always positive all the way down through the DHA. In order to get these kind of X-shaped cracks, it's usually HFTO. HFTO, high frequency, torsional oscillation. <laughs> anywhere from 10 to hundreds, maybe five, 600 Hertz at least. Uh, and, uh, you know, 30 G's, if you're, if you're measuring 30 to hundred G's are not uncommon. Uh, I need to roughly convert that into radians per second kind of thing to uh, radians per second square to get the accelerations really, uh, 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 kind of in a more neutral format, but you'll see this, uh, when you see this in the tool failure, uh, uh the question is, we're probably drilling a hard rock and we need to go in and suppress the HFTOs. So, okay. Uh, we are, we, that is it. That is the presentation. Uh, we've got probably just a minute or two for questions. But perfect, perfect timing. Um, just one question left in the Q&A box. As I say, Dustin's um, been doing a great job answering the technical stuff. This question really is, I guess, a general question about the ability to mix and match cutters in different positions on the bit, depending on where you need tangential toughness, where you need, uh, you know, thermal resistance. And also there's a, in the same question, there's a mention of cutter shapes, which I guess is another ingredient these days that we can add to the, to the variation. So a bit of a mixed question there on mixing and matching cutter types on the same bit. Um, yeah, so let's let's talk types versus sides. I don't really like match, uh, mixing cutter sizes. Small cutters and large cutters intermixed and or inside the cone and outside and all that. Where you have that transition from one cutter size to the other, there's always a, a glitch in the load per cutter. It's just, it's unavoidable. So I don't like mixing uh, uh, cutter sizes. In terms of cutter types, yes, you absolutely can. I... You know, there's some patent art on that. I don't know if it's expired or if it's still a, if it's still valid, but there is some art around match, mix and match. All the cutter vendors and the bit vendors, I know that. I, I don't know if it's current or not. Uh, we do rely on them to to, uh, to do this, but certainly you can imagine I need more thermal resistance out on the outside, but that's kind of where I need on the nose at least is where I need that tangential fracture toughness as well. So I, you know, could I could I have one cutter type inside and another cut on the outside? The answer is absolutely. Uh, I, I do see we do have mixes and matches of cutters, both in terms of chamfer size and and material properties. And quite often you can see where we transition from one cutter to the other. And sure enough, all of our damage starts showing up right at the transition. You go, okay, I either made the wrong pick or I don't have enough, uh, you know, enough toughness or whatever. So yeah, uh, certainly, certainly uh, do believe in, in mixing and matching uh, the types of damage to the types of cutters you have. And then as far as shape cutters, Historically, uh, I've avoided shape cutters uh, because they were not as tough as the just regular old full round. We're getting uh, shapes now that are really tough. So uh, we're running a lot of trials around shape cutters that I think today are uh, 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 doing well. So I've got I've got people that are asking me whether I'm going to get on on my next call here. So let me let me just answer them real quickly. But any any other questions? Well, well, I think we're time's up, Paul. So I think we'll answer any that are outstanding, and we'll get back. We'll go through the chat box in the Q and A box and, and get back to the questioner. 
Uh, but I just like to say thank you. That's a lot of information. So, uh, and I know everybody. I can see from the uh, online the comments. Everybody extremely appreciative. So thank you, thank you very much. Just a reminder that there will be the PDF of the slides and the recording of the presentation um, will be on the uh, the website for this event. I, the link to that is in the chat box. So once again, thank you very much, Paul. You bet. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Got something out of it. Oh yeah, it was great. We'll we'll uh, we'll sign off now. Thank you. Talk to you soon.